Hello, I'm Father Hezekiah Carnazzo. Welcome back to our Institute of Catholic Culture Sunday Gospel Reflection uh, here with my brother, Father Sebastian Carnazzo. Welcome, Father. Thank you. It's good to be here. Let us begin as we always do in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This week, we're looking um, at, a, at a particular text, continuing our study of Matthew, as we've been doing over the last few weeks. Um, and I want to just re- remind our listeners of um, the resource that they have available at the USCCB website. I'm going to share my screen here and um, just refer over to this particular. You can always look ahead. Uh, obviously, getting, you got to get out your Bible. Okay, It's got to be here so that you can study it. Uh, but this is a nice resource because it, it tells you what, what text we're going to be looking at. Um, Ezekiel and the Psalms, uh, Romans, Second Corinthians, and, and our focus today in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 20. Uh, last week we talked about Jesus and uh, that, that um, say, shocking statement he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, right after he has given Simon the new name in Matthew 16, 18. And now um, we hear those words almost again uh, repeated. And we're going to take a look at this gospel in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 20. Again, I, I, I recommend that you get out your Bible so that you can really study it from the, from the text you have in front of you. Jesus said to his disciples, if your, brothers, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every fact may be established in the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And there, that's that, that, that duplication of what we heard in, in Matthew 16. Again, amen, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Um, so there's our text from Matthew chapter 18. And we want to go through a couple of these things, reminding ourselves the purpose of our gospel reflection each week at the Institute is not to give a homily, but to make sure that we have the biblical tools, especially in the Old Testament, to understand what in the world Jesus is talking about. Um, so oftentimes we just hear these words, it's just Bible talk, and they just kind of wash over to us. We just go on to the next thing. But actually, Jesus' listeners, especially in this text, I think, are going to be understanding what he's saying in a broader context, which takes us back to the Old Testament. Um, and, uh, and so I just want to ask you a couple questions, Father Sebastian, this idea of two or three witnesses, uh, we've heard this before in scripture, haven't we? In the old Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. In Deuteronomy, we come to a very similar context as in Matthew's gospel. This is, as you noted back in chapter 16, we heard some of this language. And then as we talked about before, and as you commented on the transfiguration, Jesus is now preparing for his departure. He's heading to Jerusalem, as Luke refers to it as his exodus. Mm -hmm. And now as Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem, he's preparing his disciples for his absence. And this is what's going on there in Matthew 16 when he, he gives Peter his special job. And then along the way, as he's heading to Jerusalem now, after the Galilean ministry, the disciples begin to ask questions of who's going to be in charge, who's going to sit on the left, who's going to sit on the right. This is all part of that context. Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem. The, the trip from Galilee to Jerusalem would take him maybe about four days or so. They're walking. This is during the Passover, so there's probably a lot of other pilgrims going along on journey. Jesus is gathering followers by the time he gets to Jericho and he's heading up the road to Jerusalem, it says there are large crowds following him. And there are large crowds probably in front and behind as well as they're heading up these pilgrims. So the disciples are asking questions about the, who's going to be in charge uh, of, the, of this new kingdom and who's going to have what roles. And so that's the context of what's going on here. And it's interesting. It's very similar to what we get in Deuteronomy. This is the language Jesus chooses to use from Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, 
Moses is basically preparing the people, again, for his departure. Moses had been leading the people all of this time, and he's about to go up the mountain and disappear, right? As we know, Moses is not going to go into the promised land, but Joshua is going to take over after that. So Moses is preparing the people for his absence, and in doing that, in this latter part of the book of Deuteronomy, he starts to give them these community rules, how to, keep the, how to keep peace in the community. And one of the things he does is in chapter 19 of Deuteronomy, is he talks about if there's a fight between two individuals, if one individual kills somebody, an another one, what do you do in that kind of a situation? What if someone accidentally killed somebody? How do you keep the, the community at peace? And in the context of all of this, he says in chapter 19, verse 15, a single witness shall not prevail against a man for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, obviously even better, shall a charge be sustained. And then he continues on with the chapter talking about what if you only have uh, one witness? What if one person accuses somebody else? Well, then you've got to bring him before the judge, and it's much more complicated. So it's, you get this parallel language to Deuteronomy. Because like Moses, Jesus is now preparing his community, his people who have been following him for his, his uh, soon departure. And this, as we go back, we're going to take a look at this in just a minute, but this text in the epistle that's given begins to talk about these relationships within the community, a relationship of love. And there he talks about the law and how the whole law is uh, contained in really two commandments, to love God and to love your neighbor and now begins to talk about this relationship within the community. These words are very important because I think, I think today in 2017, they're almost, um, they're almost shocking. Like, um, will we ever do this? You know, haul somebody in front of the church and, and, and so forth. But I think because we miss the, the real identity of the church, which is the kingdom of God on earth, and within that kingdom, then, there are certain laws laid down by the lawgiver, by the king. And those laws reflect who God is, and God is love. And so the kingdom of God on earth, which is the church, is the beginning of the reestablishment of paradise, which is why the relationships between the people in the kingdom are so important. We are made in the image and likeness of God who lives a life of, uh, of self-giving love from all eternity, the Father pouring out his life into the Son in the Holy Spirit. And the kingdom of God, we who are made in his image and likeness, are to be living a reflection of, the, of, of, of that truth. And therefore, the uh, communion between the people uh, of, of the church is fundamentally important because it itself is supposed to be the revelation of who God is on earth as we are baptized into him. But then, uh, Jesus seems to go a step further and go and 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 not only talking about how the relationship is between the members of the church, but if someone goes so far as to disagree with the church and refuse to conform to her, they are to be treated as one who is a Gentile. And I and I think again that for us in 2017, it's almost offensive language. My question is, what did it mean to those that were listening to Jesus standing there? Well, this, this is a great example of the historical context, something that, you know, typically we don't think about when we approach the scriptures, but is, of course, as the church teaches us and its documents on scripture, so important. So look at this. Look at this. We already saw the reference to Deuteronomy and Moses, and now this reference to the church, tell it to the church, and now the Gentile or tax collector. Uh, the two others, uh, the two witnesses, obviously we saw that's in Deuteronomy, uh, treat him as a Gentile or tax collector. That sounds very Jewish, right? But then this one in the middle, tell it to the church. Well, is that also in that same context? And it is. The word church, actually, ecclesia, the word translated as church here in the English, but in the Greek there, ecclesia, appears only in two places in the gospel stories. And it's, both of them are in Matthew's gospel. Luke does not use this word. Mark does not use this word. And John does not use this word. It starts to appear in, in a, uh, a number of places when we get into Acts and then the later literature, Paul and epistles and things. 
But in this early part of the, of, the, of the story about Jesus and the establishment of the kingdom in the four Gospels, it's only in Matthew that we get the use of this word ecclesia. And again, it's a very Jewish usage. The word ecclesia, which is surprising for us as Christians often, is a word that appears all over the Old Testament. Whenever we see in the English Bible the word the congregation of Israel or the assembly of Israel in the Old Testament, so it appears in a number of places. That in the Greek version of the Old Testament is actually the word is the word ecclesia. And so again, Jesus is, is pointing out the connection and speaking of this new kingdom in language that is, is uh, easy to understand by his audience, which is, of course answers the question you first asked. How does he say to a Gentile and a tax collector, what does that mean to us? I'm, I'm, I'm a Gentile. Right? And what about the guy who's, who works for the IRS? Is that what we're talking about? No. Uh, the, the language Gentile and tax collector is language here earlier in Matthew's gospel. At the end of the gospel, he's going to say, go out and baptize all nations. But at this point in the early church, the first generation of the church, they are all Jews. And so Jesus is using language that makes sense to them. And Matthew's gospel, the earliest of the four gospels, as is the tradition of the church, is showing us that in this early stage, Jesus is still using that language for his Jewish Christian audience to understand. And that is, a Gentile or a tax collector is someone who is outside of the people of God, outside of the congregation of the new kingdom of God or the new Israel. And so he doesn't mean that because you're a Gentile or a tax collector, there's something wrong with you. No, from the inside perspective, those who are on the outside are the Gentiles, and the tax collectors. Again, this shows us the historical nature of these early, uh, these early scripture uh, texts, and especially how early in Jewish Matthew's gospel is. What does this mean for us today? Treat him as if he is somebody who is a non-Christian. That would be a translation into modern English. Hmm. There's, uh, it, it's interesting. The, um, the, it makes me think of the uh, the attack that we hear today upon uh, you know that we we hear of some communities that refuse to use the word church um, because they're a, they're modern association with a medieval or renaissance church when really if we have to remember that 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 not only did Jesus establish the church but his establishment of the church of the New Testament is a building upon a foundation which is the church of the Old Testament. Uh, this is far from being something which is um, uh, a late invention, if you will. Uh, the church is the original plan of God, which is the community bound together in a common life, and that common life is the Lord's life, bound together by that one law, which is the law of love, the sharing of one's life with the beloved. Um, uh, but, you know, we... We go one step further in the, in the next couple of verses here because Jesus begins to talk about binding and loosing. Uh, the same language he used in chapter 16 regarding Peter, he now speaks of the church. Uh, how are we supposed to understand the relationship between Matthew 16 and his teaching to Peter now in Matthew 18 and the role of the church in binding and loosing? What Again, what would that have meant to his listeners? That's a good question. And it often is... You know, in apologetics, this is one that sometimes the Baptist will ask the Catholic as he's trying to establish the role of Simon in Matthew 16. Um, the, the language in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 are similar and also different. The language of binding and loosing is, of course, identical. It, in, the, in the Greek, it literally reads, whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. It's kind of clumsy in English, and so I guess that's why the English translators don't use that. But what it's saying is what you will do is in accord with God's will. And this refers to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the church, that when the church acts in, in, its, in its role with this authority, it will be doing this when it has you know, two or three witnesses. It has... Two or three are agreed, uh, as we see uh, on something on earth, and they pray. This is the Holy Spirit is there and energizing the church and directing it, just as we saw in Acts 15 at the council. After the decision of the council, they write that letter to the church of Antioch. And in the letter, they say, 
it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no other burden than these. So the church understands, as Jesus had told them they would, that they have the Holy Spirit guiding them along the way. And what that means is that they will be doing things in accord with the will of God. You know, Not that somehow their actions are going to modify the heavenly realm or something like that. Which leads us really into the final verses here of, of the gospel text about, um, about Jesus being with us when we're bound together. I'm going to go back to this uh, and share my screen again. And we're going to look here at, this, at the, the second reading, Romans chapter 13, which focuses our attention upon the law of God which transcends all of the laws or of the Old Testament, or rather is the foundation of those laws. Um, uh, after he talks about the different commandments, um, we, we hear this beautiful phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this is it. Why is this the foundation of the law? Because it's the foundation of who God is, who lives a life of loving communion from all eternity. Then we who are baptized into Christ begin to live his life. And when two or three are gathered together and are living that life of love, it is Christ who is present here among us. In fact, it is the life of the Holy Trinity that is made manifest on earth. And we then are conformed in our prayer to the thought, the mind, and the will of God himself. There's a beautiful prayer in our Byzantine tradition. Uh, that maybe we can conclude with this. Uh, as we gather together for the Eucharistic liturgy, the priest prays that uh, you who promised that when two or three are gathered, you would be here among us. Be here present among us, and I'm paraphrasing, but be here present among us, Lord. And send down your Holy Spirit upon us and grant what we ask so long as it is pleasing to you and good for our salvation. To the extent that I have conformed my mind to the mind of Christ, then my prayer becomes almost incarnational. I begin to manifest in my love for my neighbor, in my prayer together with him, the life of God himself. And then the church truly is the revelation of the Holy Trinity here on earth, truly is the revelation of the kingdom of God. I ask you and encourage you to meditate upon this text upon not only the church as a whole, but upon your particular church in your parish and how we are living out that law of love, how we are calling each other into a deeper communion with the Lord and how we are being bound together by the love of Christ himself. May God bless you. Thank you, Father Sebastian. Let's conclude in the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.